It's only like a few steps to get drugs in Dubbo. Very hard to get treatment. An Australian church has become the world's first faith-based organisation to pass a motion advocating that drug use is decriminalised. The leader of the church has written an open letter to the Premier. Thousands have signed the petition asking Australian policymakers to stop arresting people who use drugs and instead direct funding into treatment. A hundred walkers will cover half a million steps to deliver the letter to Parliament House in Sydney. Dubbo is like the city of the outback. Ice, heroin, we need a rehab here. I was homeless and shooting up in public toilets. My friends are dying. Those junkies on the street are somebody's mother and somebody's child and somebody's father and brother and sister and they're out there and they're dying and they don't need to be. I think my son's death was avoidable if it had been treated then as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. I'm not in favour of drug use, but we're not in favour of allowing people to die. So we have to bring in policies that cause the least harm. Why is a church talking about drug law reform? Because it's our conclusion that the war on drugs has largely failed. I'm Dr Marianne Jauncey, and for the past decade, I've overseen the medically supervised injecting centre in King's Cross. The service has reduced ambulance call-out rates in King's Cross by 80%, and it's reversed more than 8,000 overdoses without a single death. The injecting centre was opened by a church in 2001, following the New South Wales Drug Summit. And now that same church has written an open letter to our politicians asking for another summit this time to modernise our drug laws and massively increase our investment into treatment. It'll be placed in a baton and walked to Sydney and it will travel 400 kilometres before it arrives. Because if you're battling addiction and you happen to live in rural New South Wales, that 400 kilometres is how far you might need to travel to get into treatment. For many people trapped in addiction, the road to recovery can be long and lonely like Chantel Irwin, a young mum from Dubbo, desperately trying to beat a dependency to crystal meth, the drug known as ice. I really want to get off ice. It's really hard because everyone around me is on it too. I don't have any friends anymore. I just stick to myself because it's too hard to be around everyone and be off it. Treatment would help. The nearest suitable treatment centre for Chantel is 400 kilometres away, here in Sydney. That's 8,000 lengths of an Olympic swimming pool, twice across Italy, or a quarter the radius of the moon. To put it another way, half a million steps. With a week to go before the big walk, a delegate of international guests flew to Sydney to support the church's fair treatment campaign. Among them, the Global Commission on Drug Policy and some bloke called Richard. Lovely to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. I'm a bit shy. Oh, well, yeah, I was shy. I managed to sort of train myself out of it over the years. But how old are your kids? 11, 7, and five. Do you sort of manage, do you think, to avoid affecting the kids or is it difficult when, when you're on drugs? Um, yeah, it's not difficult now. It used to be. Yeah. It's not difficult because you're determined to stop now. Or, yeah. Yeah. What we're trying to do is get the, you know, get the government to sort of open more clinics. So hopefully through this campaign we can get, you know, get you into treatment soon. 2,000 Aussies crammed into Sydney's town hall to attend the event. The long walk to treatment is going to be 
close to 100 Australians who are actually going to walk 400 kilometres to raise awareness about how difficult it is to access treatment. That's right. I want you to think of it as the world's longest, slowest baton relay race. They're going to be carrying in their hands a baton. That baton is going to be wrapped in a letter from the Uniting Church and they are going to get that letter to Parliament House when it kicks off in exactly one week's time. The war on drugs has been going on now for nearly 60 years. As an entrepreneur and a businessman, if something had failed so abysmally, we would have closed it down 59 years ago. It's been an, an abject failure. You know, so if we can just start treating drugs as a health problem, not a criminal problem, it's just blindingly obvious that, that you're going to start getting on top of the problem. What would you say to someone who thinks that there might be an added burden on the taxpayer if we were to treat it, people for drug addiction? Imagine the, um, the burden on the taxpayer of putting people into prison. I mean, that, it, it costs an enormous amount to have somebody in prison. We know that for every dollar you spend on treatment, you save at least seven. It's cost effective, it makes economic sense. It's basic human kindness, but it also makes good scientific sense and economic sense. <laughs> Proceedings at Town Hall drew to a close. It was time for a hundred walkers to make for Dubbo. But first, we'd better get that baton there. A few years ago, Adam Wiseman was spending a hundred bucks a day on cannabis. These days, Adam's drug free, although it doesn't stop him getting high. So we've just flown this baton from Sydney to Dubbo. It's a bloody long way to fly. Imagine walking. I've beat addiction and I've now continued on to become a flying instructor. My life just revolved around the scene of drugs. When I had money in my hand, it wasn't a certain amount of money. It was a certain amount of drugs I could purchase with that money. We, we mask our sense of loneliness with drugs and alcohol use. Here in Dubbo, everyone that I know has lost a loved one. My cousin passed away from drugs, he was 22, which I'm 32 now and, and I still feel young and I've got a lot of life to live. I, I, I think people are passing away because we're so remotely forgotten about, if that makes sense. We don't have any help, we've got um, two McDonald's, two KFC's, we've got all these things that are doubled up, but the really important stuff is like, we've got one hospital that tends to send people away when they're sick. I think, um, you know, my cousin would still be here if, if there was more support. Addiction can just take you anywhere. It's a spiral that takes you down quickly. If you haven't got support, strengths or beliefs, you're on a one-way road to, to trouble if not death. The passion for flying that I've had helped save me. Every king of the skies needs a great guru. For Adam, that person was flying school owner Dan Compton. I'd rather someone who's made progress from a hard place than someone who's just always had it easy. You know, everyone has their bad times and it's just, it's what you do about it and Adam's done something. Three years ago, the Uniting Church made history. Their ruling body in New South Wales and the ACT passed a resolution to campaign for the decriminalisation of drugs in small quantities 
and to increase access to treatment. They became the first church in the world to pass such a resolution. And it weirdly didn't feel that momentous. It didn't feel like we'd moved our church into a brand new space. It just felt like, well, of course we should do this. Treatment as opposed to punishment is a gospel imperative. But looking back on it and looking at the community now, how they're responding to us, I realised how momentous it actually was. Simon Hansford is the leader of the Uniting Church in New South Wales and the ACT. For 12 years, he was the church minister here in Dubbo. It's a community he knows well. So when I was minister here, some of the funerals I had to do were linked with drug or drug taking or drug overdosing. And speaking to a family who are already grieving and struggling to think that there could have been another way forward is always one of those why questions and it's hard. As a secular person myself, it's amazing to me that a religious group continues to push the envelope for sensible, progressive drug policy in Australia. The question is, why? The reason we're involved is because we think Jesus says to us, the place you belong is with those who are battling. And I think with drug treatment and those who are addicted, I think he would add probably those, those faces into that story. I wondered if the church had also paused to consider that age-old theological stress test. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus, for example, be on this walk? Ha, <laughs> that's a good question. Jesus spent a lot of time walking around, so I think this walk may well have appealed to him. I've, I'm I would pretty, think so, I'm yes. Confident. I mean, yes, we wouldn't definitely. be involved if we didn't have that conviction that Jesus yeah. would have been full on board with it. Yeah. In fact, as I was to learn, there was a precedent for Jesus rebelling against laws. Jesus of Nazareth uh, had a bad habit, of, well, a good habit in my mind, really, of uh, testing the laws, breaking the laws, when it was for the benefit of people. Healing on the Sabbath was one. Jesus healing on the Sabbath is an example of life being more important than rules. And our hope is that people who are ill will actually find themselves addressing treatment rather than punishment. Victoria Park, Dubbo. The opening leg of the long walk to treatment. And quite a crowd had gathered to cheer those first few steps. Us being so isolated from a, um, a major city, I think it's harder. And um, it's getting worse, there's no two ways about it. Younger children are getting onto heaven knows what, and ice is a big problem, not just in Dubbo, but everywhere. G'day everybody, it's good to be home in Dubbo again. This needs to happen, harm minimisation, treatment, and support for those who are most in need in our community, and we proudly stand with them. Dubbo Mayor Ben Shields was on standby to get proceedings underway, and with a snip of the mayoral scissors, send 100 walkers from Chantel's hometown to her nearest suitable treatment centre. Treatment availability in New South Wales is a postcode lottery. If you're born in a rural location, treatment can be geographically unobtainable and addiction can be a life sentence. The problem is particularly acute for the Indigenous community and women with children living in rural areas. These are more than statistics. These are real people. People like Chantel. I've been walking all day with the button. The legs are sore, but it's all worth it in the end, I guess. The weather's been heaps hot. And the flies stick to you. <laughs> I hope that it will better people doing this walk. And more well, I care. So I'm do something that can help people. Chantel is telling a story on behalf of many other people of New South Wales, many other Australians. I mean, there's 200,000 Chantelles around Australia. That's what we know. That's what the evidence tells us. There's 200,000 people every year in this country who can't get the treatment they need.
As night falls in Dubbo, tomorrow's first walkers are bush camping and getting ready for an early start. Among them, Adam, our Batten delivery pilot. Along with his friend Jamie, Adam has set up a social inclusion project, helping young people connect with their culture. I started touching drugs when I was 16. Um, I thought it was cool at the time and all my friends were doing it, so why not, you know? Probably 85% of people in my life are on drugs. I've lost more friends and family to overdose and suicide than natural illness. None of them people had to die. There's so many people out there that need help, don't know where to find it, or there's lack of help to be found. So it's either continue doing what you're doing or end up, mm. you know, dead. Like I've applied for a few rehab places, but the one that we were looking at was in Sydney, but that's six hours away. They wouldn't help me for being here. There's, we don't have anything like that here. I think if there was a facility like that, you'd see a decline in, in self-harm, suicide or attempts of. Um, crime statistics would get lower. Um, you know, overdose rates, all these things. I've, I've thought about killing myself so many times. I guess the point where I shouldn't have to try to kill myself to get the help. I shouldn't yeah. have to physically do it. People see that as the easy way out because it it's is. easier to do that than go and seek help. Easier than ask you know, for help. Than to knock on the door and say, I need help. You know, it's, it's harder than trying to do yourself in. That's, that's but, we still but, but I think that's the case is we're knocking on the people are knocking on the door asking for help and they come back face. later. You can only go upwards from here, you know. Rock like um, you've got your whole life ahead of you. You've, um, you can do whatever you want. And if this is your big issue in life, you found it at 19. It's shitty, but everyone has shitty lifestyles, but they wouldn't be who they were in the end of it. Like, if you didn't have what you had, would you be sitting here right now? Probably be in jail and who knows, like I, I was destined for that outcome, to be honest. Yeah. Addictions are hard. Yeah. And yeah. if you can conquer this, well, you can get a job, you can help people, you can share your story and, and help others, you know, because it's, it's hard. In spite of a late evening yarn around the campfire, our walkers are up with the birds, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for the road ahead. For Johnny, his parents have struggled with crystal meth all his life. It's taken its toll, but Johnny's a fighter. An Australian national champion fighter at that. These are the belts that I've currently got over my last 17 fights. A lot of hard work and dedication have been put into this. Mum Candy describes Johnny as her role model. Every time he fights, I'm the last one in the crowd. Yeah, it was a shame. <laughs> Johnny's been through a lot with my drug use. I've seen him cry, hurt. i never done it in front of the kids. Always was ashamed of it. I would like to give him the world, but I've taken so much off him. She's saying that I didn't know she was using it, but you know, like, you know when they're up, when they're coming down. It took me years to realise how much I've affected my kids. I lost my morals, respect. My kids. My mate, my partner. My life. So it don't just affect the person using it, it affects the whole family. So. <laughs> like Johnny's a good kid and I... I'm embarrassing because of the drugs. And he has to hide it, I think. I want the best for him. I want the best for all the kids. But I can't give it to him because I can't help myself. I need to help myself. But I, I don't know where. And there's no help here. Finding out that she'd have to move to Sydney for treatment was crushing for Candy and Johnny. I feel like you, know, you don't meet as much as people up there sort of thing. Like, feel like, yeah, just because we're out this far out. 
And the amount of drugs that are in this town is unbelievable. Like every second house, you're looking for it, you find it in 10 minutes. I've seen heaps of families fall. I've tried to keep our family together. I don't want to see no one else go through it. She needs a rehab, that's, that's the end of the story. Yeah, it's, it's shatters you sort of thing, you know, but there's not much you can do, like. Is it really? <laughs> Parts of the media have dubbed Wellington the North Pole because of the prevalence of the drug known as ice. The truth is this is a town where people need help and support. The Reverend Peter Harvey is the church's leader in this area. I want to say to my community that we stand with you. You go back to that age old question, you know, what would Jesus do? Jesus would be walking with these people. That's what he did. He walked where the people were. He walked into the issues and faced them and, and met with the people who, the vulnerable and the people who were, stood out on the edges of society. You know, for me, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and again and expecting a different result. We've been beating drugs on the head with a lump of 4B2 for years and it hasn't worked. Well, when Dad left, that was a lot of sadness, and I have to get over that, to get over drugs, I guess. A lot of things I've got to get over to get off the drugs. Every birthday, I was wishing for him to come back, and he never come back. He just wiped me completely out of his life. A broken heart hurts, I guess. and I just couldn't take it anymore. But, you know, I couldn't leave my kids behind. I was broken, and I dealt with it through drugs. Then it was an addiction, and, and then, yeah, it's not good. Treatment would work because I'm determined and I want to get help. You know, you learn from lessons. If you don't learn, you don't move forward. Chantelle's only crime is her use of drugs. As a society, our view is that Chantelle is a criminal. That, that's not my view. Addiction often affects the most marginalised in our society, but no one is immune. Aged 18, Steve had it all. He was a rising rugby league star with a Premier League contract at Cronulla Sharks. He captained Australia at under 16 level and was touted for glory. But Steve had always been racked with self-doubt. For a while, drink and drugs compensated for that, until they took a hold. I was faking injuries so I didn't have to go to training. I was hung over and I got advance payments off the football club and blew it on the pokies and I was drinking every night now, you know, looking for people to drink every night. And the football club noticed pretty, pretty quickly and said, you know, we can't have you around here, you know. And now I'm 18 years old, 19 years old, and I'm hanging around blokes who aren't footballers and full of grog, you know, so my um, sort of judgment was clouded anyway. 
That's where I first tried ice, and my life went downhill 100 kilometres an hour straight away. You know, I still remember my little brothers crying, saying, you've got to stop. But I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't stop. It came to a point where I couldn't see a way out, you know, and I tried to commit suicide and, and hang myself. And um, fortunately, you know, my brother came outside. I don't know what made him come outside that night, neither does he, but something, something I suppose, watching over us made him come outside and find me hanging from a tree. Steve is one half of Brothers for Recovery, a drug, alcohol and mental health charity to help those struggling with addiction. Co-founder, Jeff, battled a drug problem for years before he met Steve in rehab and they turned their lives around. That's where addiction takes you. And my mum loved me with, I'm a real child and and it came to a point in time where she told me I had to go. And she said, I love you, you're my son, and I'll always love you, but I, you're killing me. I was homeless. A bit of crime was starting to come into my life, and um, I was starting to sit on courtroom steps. 200 kilometres down, and we've reached the halfway mark. Bathurst mum, Sarah, takes the baton. Like so many who suffer from addiction, her childhood featured trauma. Yeah, life, it was just very hard. I was molested as a child, always thinking, you know, that I had done something wrong to make somebody invade my personal space. I was about 12 and a half years old when I started using heroin for the first time. Before I started using drugs, I felt very ashamed, very hurt. Life was just shit. And then when I used heroin, it made things feel better. When I was 19, I had my first child who was heavily addicted to heroin and methadone. It was a really hard thing, really hard. Here's the thing, treatment works and people do turn their lives around. I've been in recovery for 14 and a half years. It doesn't matter if you've got a drug addiction or a food addiction. Everybody deserves to have a second chance and to be happy. This is not radical. We're not guessing about this stuff. We know that treatment works. We have absolutely clear, irrefutable evidence that it saves money. We just need to get on and do it. The treatment shortage is severe. One in two people who need treatment find that there's no room at the inn. To put that in human terms, imagine the two people you love most in the world needing potentially life-saving help for any health condition. And then imagine only one receiving it. Me and Steve, we go out to um, remote communities. There's a lot of people out there that are, that are crying out for help but then they're turned away because there's no treatment available. If they do a crime, they'll get locked up at night. The court system's really readily accessible um, when you do something wrong, but when you're ready to do something right, where's that avenue? I called every treatment centre in New South Wales and there was a huge waiting list. The longest I've heard is over a year, nearly two years. When an alcoholic or an addict puts their hand up, you've only got a small window period. I've actually heard of people dying on waiting lists, waiting to get treatment. It happens so often, it happens. It should never happen. Nobody should ever have to die while waiting to get into treatment. To want help and to not get it, it's not okay. Dr Alex Wodak is an eminent commentator on drug policy and was part of the force 
behind Australia's first needle exchange program. We need to expand and improve drug treatment and it's got to be no better, no worse than any other health service. So like treatment for breast cancer, diabetes, heart disease. Um, and we're a long way short of that. Taking the baton to its next port of call is Dave, another walker with first-hand experience of the issue. Uh, my name's Dave, I'm an addict. 30 years of addiction's left a, uh, it's left a legacy, you know. Um, I believe I, I look like a drug user, so there's quite a lot of stigma that, that's attached. People look at me when I'm on the train, shopkeepers looking at you like you're gonna steal something from them, um, to people crossing the other side of the street. It makes me feel awful. But I also got to take some self-acceptance um, and self-responsibility and it's, it was a path that I chose. But yeah, it de definitely does hurt. You know, we're just like everyone else, really. We're, we're just humans. I, I even went to the point of getting ad addict tattooed across my chest because I believed that's who I was and I embraced it. And it was one of the worst things I ever did. I was very young, very stupid, and I, I thought that um, yeah, instead of people sort of going, oh, look at him, look at him, if I put it there, people won't have to do that. It's like me saying, yeah, look at me, look at me, I am, I am that person. I, I don't need a label now because I look like, you know what I mean? Who needs a label when you can clearly see what I am? I look at myself in the mirror and just think, what have I done to my life? You know, what have I done with the last 30 years? You know, and then I see how I look and how it's changed me, and it, and it just breaks my heart. Dave is not alone. One of the biggest barriers to treatment in Australia is the fear of social stigma. Our tendency to label people who use drugs can be so pervasive that many start to believe it. I hated myself, I felt putrid, um, and people, people look down on me. People looked down on me so much and I was actually really okay with that because I looked down on myself. Having people judge me like that, it, it became very easy to start judging myself like that. I didn't know about addiction until I got into treatment. I was just a junkie. Oh yeah, for 16 years I was nothing but a junkie. The whole world told me that. I thought, felt like I was only the drug and the drug was me. I do find it difficult to be in social situations where questions might come up about, about it. Um, yeah, I judge myself very harshly as well. And it makes me constantly think about who I am as a person and what I've done. All brothers and sisters, you shouldn't make anyone feel different. You make someone give up on themselves, and how are they going to get better? According to the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Association, because of the shame associated with drug use, people often suffer in silence. In fact, on average, people wait an astonishing 18 years before putting their hand up. That took me years to ask for help. And when I did ask for help, I was getting put down, put down. I said, I'm putting my hand up. And it's funny you say that, the sort of the 18 years, because that was pretty much around where I sort of, oh, I put my hand up. We often hear that people choose to take drugs, but no one who tries illicit drugs for the first time is choosing addiction, just as no one who tries alcohol chooses to be an alcoholic. Um, when I was a young girl, I didn't know what heroin was, so there was definitely no dreams to be sitting in the gutter shooting up heroin. And there's no way I would have envisioned wanting to be a heroin addict. Yeehaw. <laughs> At school, when you're full of all that innocence, you're not going, man, I can't wait till I'm an adult so I can really get off my head. When you're a child, you don't dream of having that life. People with addiction begin life as we all do, with aspirations and dreams. When I was younger, I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a pilot. I planned to be a teacher or save the stomach kids in Africa. Now, I probably wanted to be a policeman, actually. Believe it or not, I actually wanted to be a policeman when I grew up. I don't know where I went wrong, but somewhere I went off the path and yeah, I was meant, wanted to be a cop. If you ask a little boy or a little girl what they want to be when they grow up, 
I guarantee you will not hear an answer that says, when I grow up, I want to live on a park bench and use heroin or methamphetamine. When I grow up, I want to be a police officer so that I can arrest naughty people. When I grow up, I want to be an actor, an author, a writer and a dancer. I want to be a ballerina! Our aspiring ballerina is Liz Gow's daughter. Liz so nearly wasn't alive to have her. For many years, she used to visit our injecting centre in King's Cross and even overdosed there on one occasion. She ran away from home aged 15, just a year older than her son Les is now. The impact of my addiction was absolutely huge for so many people. Um, I know my mum came and looked for me so many times and, and I'm sure my parents and other family members had so many sleepless nights. Her addiction caused her mum years of anguish. I didn't know what to do at all. It was like helplessness because there wasn't anyone that I knew that I could go to for help. The first night I slept rough was on a table just over there. Having a teenage son now, I can't imagine how it would be if he just disappeared one night and if I didn't know if he was dead or alive. I thought she might die and um, I spoke to Lizzie and she believed that she would die as well. I 100% believe that I would not be here today if I hadn't got a bed when I did. If it wasn't for treatment, Lizzie would be dead, for sure. Sydney's Jarrah House Rehabilitation Centre saved her life. I can't imagine how it would have been for Les if I had died. Um, he's older now and he has an understanding of addiction, but he just would have been, my mum didn't care enough about me to not die. She's got Les back now. You know, I'm not the mum anymore, I'm the grandmother. It's a lot, a lot better. My daughter is three at the moment and to think that in 12 years time that yeah, she could run away from home and be shooting up heroin is absolutely horrific. I would chase her and I would look for her and I would try to stop her, um, but what I'm hoping is in 12 years time there's enough treatment centres. I've got three kids. I want them to grow up drug free, having a good life. If one of my kids ever got into drugs, I, I think I'd come down on them like a ton of bricks, but at the same time I know that that wouldn't be so helpful because it wasn't helpful for me. I've got kids of my own, if they suffered from a drug addiction, I would like uh, medical staff help them to rehabilitation as opposed to police knocking on the door saying they're OD'd down the road or they're in jail or they've been um, part of criminal acts. A criminal conviction for minor drug possession can send people down a road that is fraught with pitfalls. Impacts include difficulties with employment, restriction of travel and family breakup. It can be a desperate journey and one that Michelle knows all too well. It literally destroyed my life. I lost custody of my oldest daughter and it absolutely devastated me. She was my world. And I've never gotten custody of her back. She's my driving force, the reason why, and, and all of my kids, they're the reason why I get up and do what I do every morning. Um, I want them to have the sort of lifestyle that I never had. Um, I want them to, to um, live happy, productive lives and be really powerful women, you know. My kids are the reason why I'm clean today. This is the only choice that there is to make. Um, I can have something that absolutely destroys my life or makes me feel like crap or I can have these beautiful children who just bring so much joy to my world every day. They're, they're, they're a blessing. The procession marched into Bidwell, where an unexpected visitor awaited.
Having heard about the walk in the media, Josh had travelled from Sydney's King's Cross to take part. For three days, he'd been trekking the Blue Mountains and sleeping outside churches, all in search of the walker's convoy. I've spent the last few days trying to track down the baton in the Blue Mountains so I could walk it to Sydney. I was a heroin addict for about 16 years on and off and when I needed the help it wasn't there for me and I've never felt so strongly about something in all my life than what this baton represents. I've got to do it for the ones I've lost. It's, this thing's so important. Tony Trimmingham is a long-time Blue Mountains resident. He still recalls the day his son Damien told him he was using heroin. He just looked at me and he said, the shit's hit the fan, Dad. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I'm on heroin. I knew he'd used drugs before. I knew he'd used cannabis. I knew he'd drank alcohol underage and for quite a while. But heroin was something I never expected. And I, I was devastated and I called him every name under the sun. I, I really didn't treat him very well considering he was in such a, a down state. And I, I was like within an hour I'd exhausted all these emotions and I was drained and I just collapsed in a chair. I said, we're gonna fix it, we're gonna fix it. I started trying to find places to get him fixed. Um, and that was when, of course, I found that there was nothing, there was no support. Nobody wanted to talk to me. They did it by telephone. I was in my office in Chatswood and I got a phone call and it was a young policewoman and she said, we have a deceased person and we want to eliminate your son. 90% of me knew it was, but I was hanging on to that 10%. Uh, and the only thing that I suppose taking a sheet off his face did was took away the 10% because I knew then that of course it was him. Um, yeah. The pain just cuts through you. You can't describe the pain. Sometimes you just, it's so intense that you can hardly bear it. It's almost physical. I used to go up to Chatswood Police Station with his mobile phone records and say, these are drug dealers, you know. These are drug dealers. I wanted them to get them, and uh, and after a few few times of doing this, the policeman said, "You know, Mr. Trimmingham, what are you doing?" I then started to think of how I could use that anger in a more constructive way. So I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to the Sydney Morning Herald, and I talked about a junkie dying in a back alley with a needle in his arm. And then I spoke about a funeral of a much-loved young man where 600 people come and talk about his talents and qualities. And I said, this is the same person. It's not a statistic, it's my son. And we need to do something different. Since his son's death, Tony has set up a 24-hour national phone line to support parents and relatives whose families are affected by addiction. It receives tens of thousands of calls a year mostly from mothers. It's a different kind of grief now. It's uh, what I missed. The conversations I haven't had over those 22 years. The children you might have had. The, 
wondering about whether he would have given up his heroin, whether he would have gone on and achieved something. I'm fairly convinced he would have. I've met a lot of people who have overcome substances of all kinds, and some of them go on to achieve really, really big things. He didn't have the opportunity. He, he was taken before he could have made any of those decisions that might have seen him on a different path. Tony's story is tragic, but all too common. Opioid overdose is now killing more than a thousand Australians a year. That's more than three a day. Further, drug-related deaths continue to occur at music festivals. Pill safety testing helps young people understand the dangers of potentially using drugs. And in countries like Switzerland, it's shown to be life-saving. These lives belong to our children. So, is it time we introduced a similar program here in New South Wales? Pill testing is a no-brainer. Nobody wants their kids to use drugs. They'd prefer they didn't. But for God's sake, they don't, certainly don't want that policeman knocking on the door. In the rugged, natural region west of Sydney sit the majestic Blue Mountains. And one walker, Craig Irvine, is ready to navigate the region's cliffs, forests and waterfalls in pursuit of fairer drug policy. You know, my childhood, you know, when I look back at it now, was uh, pretty dysfunctional. There was a lot of alcohol, um, uh, abuse, you know, violence. My dad left when we were when I was 12 years old, you know, and um, you know my mum done her best. Life was a big struggle for her too, you know. You know, uh, my mother passed away when I was 23. It was uh, very unexpected. I um, there was a bang on the door, you know, and it was one of my my old friends from school who was a policeman, and he and he told me my mum had passed away. Uh, outside the front door of the Chinese restaurant, you know. Yeah. Probably the worst day of my life. Yeah, no doubt. I still carry it today. You know, um, she was 52 years old when she died, and when we got the death certificate back, we, we discovered that my mother was an acute alcoholic, you know. Um, that's, um, you know, something I was probably in denial for for a long time. Not being able to sit with that stuff was a big part of it, you know. Um, a normal person would be able to sit with it, they'd, they'd deal with it, you know, but um, me, I just couldn't deal with it, so that's why I took drugs. Yeah. He went from using a little bit over a weekend to using all day, every day for the next you know, 18, 19 years. I'd go to prison for, for, for the crimes that I committed and, uh, you know, I'd be walking out and, and the screw would say to me, we'll see you next time, mate. And I'd go, no, you wouldn't. And the next time I'd walk in, he'd say, I told you. And, uh, you know, there was one day I remember being in King's Cross and I looked up and at the next cafe up, there were three people from NA up there. I don't know what, but something propelled me up out of my chair and I walked up to him and I said to him, I'm stuffed, I'm done, you know? And they all clapped. They all went, well, hey, finally. Because these guys had known me for a long time, you know, and they, they never thought I was gonna come around, you know? And um, that, was, that was the start of my recovery, yeah. 85 days later was my clean day, which was the 20th of January, 2016. Um, and uh, I've been clean ever since, yeah. <sighs> means that no screw locks the door on me at night time anymore. No screw tells me I'll see you next time. 
you know. I have a choice today, you know. Tears of joy, you know. Look where I am. Look at this. Who would have thought three years ago that, uh, you know, my life could be like this, you know. Now I, I work for um, an electrical company in, in Darlinghurst, an electrical wholesaler, and uh, I'm a delivery driver. I pick orders and I go and deliver them. It's something that I, I enjoy very much. I've learned that I have a good work ethic. I always get to work on time, I always get to work 15 minutes early, and I always put in a little bit extra, you know, because, um, you know, it's, um, I feel like I need to make things up, you know, so that's what I do. At the end of prison, Craig was taking more drugs and committing more crime. Then Craig gets into treatment, Craig gets better. Now, Craig is paying money into the system because he's a taxpayer and he's employed. Go figure. Seventy-two kilometres from the finish line is the town of Springwood, where one local church was ready to welcome the baton in style. Australia has been uh, identified as the wealthiest nation on the earth and that we have 13% of our population who's, who live below the poverty line. If that doesn't feed into this issue, I don't know what does, and surely we can do better by doing things differently. In attendance was Federal MP Susan Templeman, a sign perhaps that politicians were being inspired by the walk? When you think about the option of arrest and criminalisation, uh, you say, well, how is that going to make things better? And of course it doesn't. It, it actually makes things worse. So I can't see the sense in continuing to make life harder for people who are clearly doing it tough. Bringing the baton to the congregation is local resident Rosalind. With the help of treatment, she's beaten her drug dependency and turned her life around. It's an amazing honour to be asked to do the baton not just because it recognised what had happened to me, but because I think it's significant, me being an atheist. That just blew my mind. My life was pointless. I didn't feel like that anyone was ever gonna love me. So what was the point in continuing, you know, this crap existence at the time? It took me a long time to get out of that, but it is possible now completely free of drugs and alcohol. As local ministers Lee and Graham take the baton out of Springwood, it's a good time to reflect on the harms that our current drug policy is causing to the lives of the very people it's aiming to help. We've been here in Springwood for a little over two years, but prior to that we were in the Central West, so we know Dubbo well and, and all the places that a long walk to treatment has, has been. And we're aware of the lack of services as well. This issue about the fair treatment of people who have drug dependency is all about doing what is good for them and for our communities, as opposed to our current way of approaching it, which is not getting us anywhere. I think a fair bit of it is that the problem goes underground, that because yeah. it's stigmatised, uh, looked down upon, that it becomes, lar it's largely secret. It's like people have to say, I'm a terrible, terrible person and I'm a failure. And really, you know, the idea is we want to kind of allow people to say, no, you're a, you know, you're a real person and you're a valuable person. And, uh, and we, you know, Jesus' idea was we want to make everybody whole. I don't believe in God, but the church being involved is amazing and really, really cool and outside the box. The city of Parramatta in Western Sydney. The church-run Parramatta Mission provides food and shelter for homeless and marginalised locals.
I'll come here every so often to get a free meal because I'm um, I'm still relatively poor and um, in early recovery. You know, I can see that my life's changing, and I, I want to be uh, I want to be accepted by society. You know, just um, but also I want to share my experience and, and um, hopefully help other people to be able to do that as well. Anthony is a local resident who eats at the mission. I have two children. One of them's not um, biologically mine, but I still think of her just, just the same. She's now 17 and my son is 12. And I've taken drugs as long as I've known them. My drug taking has now hit me to rock bottom and this is the worst I've ever been. I feel low, I feel like a piece of shit, yeah? But the only person that can change it is myself. And I just don't know where to start. For some, like Julie, the challenge to find treatment extends to the whole family. I've suffered from addiction since I was 16. Now I've got a daughter who's 25 and she has a meth habit. She's opened up and asked for help and she can't get into a rehab because she lives in northern New South Wales. She's ended up in jail over not having a proper address. Now she's on the run from the police and I'm just waiting for that phone call. Every day I think about what could happen. Her dying, her, her passing away. So the problem in Australia is that we spend your taxpayers' dollars on the wrong thing. The vast amount of money for drugs goes into the things that don't work. Police, courts, customs, prisons, locking people up, criminalising people for a disease. Actually, what we need to do is put the money into treatment and into harm reduction. We'd do a lot better and we'd save a lot of cash. Like morphine, heroin is a strong opiate designed for pain relief. And we need to remember why people are taking it. Very often it's because they're self-medicating, because they are in pain. In fact, symptoms can be remarkably consistent. I didn't feel like I belonged, you know. I'd, I had noises inside my head saying I'm not as good as the other kids around me. I didn't feel like I belonged to the human race and I didn't feel like I belonged in the family. I always felt I didn't belong anywhere. I felt less than. I, I didn't think I was good enough. I've never really felt, I don't know, safe or secure or wanted. Not wanted, not good enough. Sorry. <laughs> and heroin just stopped it all. It made me numb. It made me warm. It, um, I fell in love with it. It made me numb. It just made me stop feeling all this pain, all this hurt. It just took all the pain. It took every feeling that I had in my body out of it. It's just silence for the first time in my life. And it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever felt, honestly. The price that I've had to pay, it hasn't been worth it. Our next two walkers believe that people who use drugs should not be criminalised. And given their former jobs, that might be surprising. It was with great reluctance that I found myself duty-bound to apply the law. I would have much preferred that there was some other course that could be taken. 
Well, I just came to realise a long time ago that arresting people for use and possession, particularly, uh, was counterproductive. The punishment far outweighed the crime in most cases, particularly with recreational, recreational users. Even for very small scale use or possession, crimes that carry maximum penalties of two years imprisonment, it's crazy and the law needs to be changed. Dr. Robert Graham has spent his career working with people in addiction. One example of how drug law enforcement makes things worse is the comparison between morphine and heroin. Pharmacologically, they're almost identical, and yet one is much more harmful than the other. Why is this? It's because of the effect of criminalisation on one and not the other. If our, the intention of our policy is to put toxic substances on the, on the street and make them available to anybody that wants them in a marketplace run and driven by organised criminal gangs, our policy is working very well. But if the aim of the policy is to reduce drug use and the harms associated with it, it's an abject failure and we should tear it up. Instead of addressing some kind of harm by these laws, we're actually increasing the harms. And I think that's a, a direct contravention of the purpose of the criminal law and indefensible in practice. In the last seven years, crime across New South Wales is down, and yet the number of people incarcerated has increased by a third. Many experts put this down to a rise in drug-related arrests. I have been to prison. There's more drugs in there than there is out here. Jail didn't change me. You've only got to walk to a cell next to you and the, the drugs are there. I use drugs in there pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis. You go to jail for drugs, you're going to learn how to make drugs, how to sell drugs, how to make money off drugs. You're not going to learn how to get off drugs. That is the wrong way to go about it. Jail is no cure for drugs whatsoever. The common experience uh, in my through my time, and I think through most people's time, is that people that went in with a, a minor drug problem came out with a larger one. Uh, and that's in a prison setting. So I'm going to say, if you, we can't control drugs in a prison setting, we haven't got much chance in the wider community. Most concerningly, we are further disadvantaging some of Australia's already marginalised groups. Women are being incarcerated at a faster rate than men, and incarceration rates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders is now 13 and a half times higher than the rest of the population. I'm not the smartest toy in the shed, but I know, I know what works, and, and that didn't work for me. Treatment worked for me. Support, being treated like a human being, being a member of a community, that's what will get people off them. We've never spent anywhere near enough money on treatment. If somebody close to me was caught up with drug use, I would want health treatment. The last place I'd want to see them is in a court of law. For heaven's sake, it might be just an experimental thing that that person has done, uh, didn't particularly like it, and isn't going to do it again. Um, young people do experiment, and we have to accept that if they do, well then there are better ways of dealing with it than making them a full-time criminal. As a young detective, I found myself arresting decent young Australians who had never come to attention to police for any other crime, weren't really ever likely to, who were planning careers in a whole range of areas, including teaching and police and defence, and the list went on. Little tiny quantities were likely to, to kill these people's careers. Think, what, what sort of policy is that? Why would we want to do that to people who, again, had never come to notice of police and weren't ever likely to for any other crime or offence? Just what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Today still, when I go for job interviews, they regularly want to bring out my police criminal history and they look at it and go, oh, drugs, we don't have a position here for you. All of the criminal behaviours that we as society abhor violence, theft, we're not talking about those things, we're talking about separating the two things. So we have drug use, which is, a, which is a health issue, and people who don't do crime, but have a problem with drugs, or who want to use drugs recreationally, should be able to do that. However, we're not saying that if someone assaults a person because they need drugs, 
that they should get a free pass. Many who are criminalised for drug use have committed no other crime. The impact on families is huge and it's costing the taxpayer millions. With the law as it is at present, uh, police and prosecutors and the courts really are wasting their time and, and the community's money. Cannabis, for example, smaller quantities of cannabis, probably two police officers are going to accompany that person to a police station. They're going to be fingerprinted uh, and processed and bailed. That takes police officers again. Unless they're very lucky, they're going to go, be going to court where they're going to appear. If they don't want to plead guilty, they're going to have to come back and a hearing will, will occur. The police officers who arrest them have to give evidence. If the offence is considered serious enough to warrant a prison term, there's the cost of incarceration. And they're huge, of course, you know, it costs a lot of money to keep somebody in prison. Much smaller resources could be applied to health and there'd be a huge saving to the community. Everything about our focus on prohibition uh, has proven to be a failure and uh, we keep paying the penalty for it. Until we have the courage to do something about that, we'll continue to get what we've always got. We can't arrest your way out of this problem. And we need to understand that we have to be prepared to look at new ways to do business here. 26 countries outside Australia are starting to take a different approach. Like Portugal, who in 2001 decriminalised drug use and possession and instead shifted funding into health responses. Many predicted the sky would fall in. Surely, if harmful drugs were no longer illegal, use would skyrocket and all our kids would be permanently stoned. In fact, the opposite happened. Less people use harmful drugs in Portugal now than they did during Prohibition. Coincidence? I don't think it's coincidence at all. I think wherever you're looking at uh, progressive drug policy, drug usage has come down. More importantly, overdose deaths and overdoses have come down very significantly. In fact, fatal overdoses in Portugal now stand at just 0.35 per 100,000 people. In Australia, our overdose death rate is 20 times higher than that and continues to rise. Australia used to be very progressive, actually, when we came to our drug policy. We were at the forefront with introducing needle syringe policies and we were the first in the English-speaking world to have an injecting centre. But we started lagging behind. Then you look at places like the Philippines where they shoot people on sight because of a suspected drug problem. Australia, where do we want to be? Surely we want to be one of the smart, progressive nations that invests in things that make a difference for all of our citizens. Ten years after treatment turned her life around, Liz now works at Phoebe House, a long-term residential rehab centre that accepts women with children. 400 kilometres from Dubbo, this would be the nearest suitable treatment centre for Chantelle. However, with only nine beds available, spaces are hard to come by. To be honest, I have no idea how many women I would be turning away a day. I would like to send a big message to Chantelle to hang in there. I know it's a really hard thing to wait and wait and call and call and travel so far to get to treatment in the city. But if she's really determined, she'll get there. And I know she can do it. And I know she can live this long, drug-free, prosperous life. Rebecca is a young mother from Newcastle and she's finally managed to get in. She had to travel 170 kilometres and move here from the central coast. I looked around everywhere and this place is one of the only ones of its kind in the whole country. There is a lot of people out there like Chantel in the cycle of addiction and that want help and there's just none out there. We've made some shitty choices, but we're not bad people. I have two daughters, an eight-year-old and a three-year-old, and they mean the world to me. They're beautiful, and they, they don't deserve to have a mum that's on drugs and that's not emotionally there for them. I 
having my daughter taken from me was heartbreaking. It was one of the worst pains I've ever gone through. And to get her back, I'll stop at nothing. I'll do everything I need to do plus more to be able to have her full time again. She's in that age where, where she understands that I'm not there. And I've explained it to her in a way that I'm sick and I'm here getting better. And mum is not gone forever and I'll be back. Rebecca is using her time in recovery to obtain new professional qualifications and is about to embark on a career in welding. By the time she leaves here, we'll have her in a steady job and she'll be able to start working whilst she provides for her daughter. Sydney's King's Cross home to the Uniting Medically Supervised Injecting Centre and many who sleep rough in this city, including our friend Josh from the Blue Mountains and his mate, Taz. We're at King's Cross right now. Big morning tomorrow. Batten's finally going to reach Parliament House, Sydney. Tomorrow the Batten arrives at the Parliament House in Macquarie Street and that is going to be an incredible day because now the politicians have the opportunity to do something about it. Why do I take drugs? I have been chemically changing my reality since I was about eight years old. I suffered through 12 years of serious child sexual assault from the age of five to 17 that nobody knew about because the perpetrators told me that if I told anyone, they'd do the same thing to my little brother and sister. The reason I take amphetamines is my, my fear is going to sleep and not being able to escape what was happening to me. I'm, I'm hanging out now, yeah. It was two days ago I had a shot. I, I haven't got the money for it. I don't commit crime to support me habit, because I, I think that's totally wrong. You know? So tonight I'm gonna fall asleep at some stage and I'm not getting worried about that. The anxiety levels are slowly increasing. So unless I get some, some, some ice into, me, into my arm or a half a kilo of coffee beans down my neck, yeah, I'm gonna go to sleep tonight and I'm gonna suffer again. I've tried to commit suicide 47 times because I can't deal with the monsters in my head. And the only time that they play nicely with me is when I sit in front of the piano at Wayside. Now I've never had a lesson and I can't read music, but I can paint beautiful notes in the air by ear and I can sort my shit out with, with the vibrations of the music. We're pushed under the carpet, we're shunned and we're um, well, don't look at that, that's homeless person on drugs, you don't want to go near them, they might be violent, they might do something. But that's a stigma that we live with every day. A lot of people look at the world I live in and they see nothing but problems, hate, anger, they see misery. But they don't open their eyes and see the compassion, the love, the moments that I see and witness. I love my life. Um, I love every minute. I make the most of my life. We get to live once. I've seen so many people miss out. They died young and they didn't get to do the things they wanted to. I don't know, I think maybe my past, which I hated myself for, maybe that's why I'm here, to help people in the future. Everyone's got one life to go and live. Dawn twinkles across the harbour. The big day has arrived. A 
Over the past fortnight, thousands have signed the Uniting Church's petition to ask politicians to work for a better future. A world where everyone is treated with dignity and respect, including people who use drugs. A world where everyone who needs treatment gets it. And a world where thousands of lives and millions of dollars can be saved. Now, wouldn't that be a nice world to live in? Yeah, it's a great turnout. It's good. It's really, really good. Yeah, it's fantastic. People are excited to be in front of Parliament. There's a lot of energy here today, and it's actually built. I think the momentum's been building, especially since the launch. My partner dragged me along to do the walk. It was good, except I got the hill parts where everything went up, went down, then went up. But yeah, it was good. You had support along the way. There's so many places that you stopped where people had stories to tell you and campfires to have. So it was all of those that, you know, had the energy and the power to get it all the way to Sydney. So. The people have spoken. This is my plea to all the lawmaking people in this country. You can stop the suffering, take away the criminal sanctions on personal use, and if this isn't enough, it will save you lots of money. Thank, thank you ever so much. This is the final moment when the baton arrives. Travelled all the way, a hundred walkers, half a million steps from Dubbo here in Sydney. Please come in close and give them a big round of applause as they complete the final leg of the long walk to treatment. Welcome Josh and Tess. read this letter for you. It's a long way from Dubbo to Sydney. We should know, as alongside a partnership of over 60 legal, health and community groups, we've just walked every step of the 400 kilometre journey. We walked here for people like Chantel, a 28 year old single mum who lives in Dubbo. Chantelle desperately wants to get treatment, but the nearest long-term rehab for her circumstances is here in Sydney. Chantelle's story is tragic, but all too common. In fact, there are 200,000 Australians out there who share her plight. In fact, we are turning away half of all those who reach out for help, a situation we wouldn't accept for any other health condition. The approach has failed. Drug-induced deaths in Australia are at their highest for two decades and are now 20 times higher than in Portugal, a country which has prioritised treatment over punishment. That's why we're asking for a People's Summit on Drug Use, with a view to modernising policy and increasing investment in treatment. The war on drugs has been lost. It's time to lay down our arms and declare peace. And I have signed this to the Throughout this walk, we've met some truly brave and inspirational people. But have our politicians heard their cry? We all want to assure you that you do have friends across the road. And we thoroughly support your call for a summit in the New South Wales Parliament. The New South Wales Upper House passed a motion in support of the long walk for treatment. That has recommended to the government increased funding for rehabilitation services in regional um, and rural New South Wales. So congratulations and on behalf of my colleagues, thank you for all your continued efforts. Oh. 
I think the politicians got the message loud and clear. I support the calls for a, another drug summit. The law and order approach by itself hasn't worked. We are in absolute admiration for those who have walked all the way from Dubbo and brought that message here to the New South Wales Parliament today. The stories were incredibly powerful. Uniting's campaign has really touched the hearts. I think if people are in Parliament, uh, it's touched me. So I really wanted to do what I could. We know the evidence is clear and that what we've been doing hasn't worked. So I've gone to Bidwell to track them down and bring this baton home to Parliament. A powerful moment in my life. It's something I'm going to remember forever. You know, a significant point in my life, you know, like I've had a little part in a great big, great big thing, you know, and it means the world to me. Receiving uh, this baton and the powerful words of Chantel uh, that really are encapsulated in what this in the walk for treatment was. It sends a very powerful message that across the street in Macquarie Street, we need to get on with the job and make sure that we shift our focus away from locking people up to actually saving lives and helping people live a full and thorough life. The majority of Australians now support a non-criminal response to all personal drug use. Today at Parliament House, the politicians listened. Nevertheless, change can be slow, and there remains a long road ahead in the Uniting Church's quest for fair treatment. We have to push on down that road. After all, a journey of many miles begins with a single step. <laughs>